and we're recording. Hello, world. Welcome back. Oh, hello there, Christina. <laughs> hello there, Michael. How are you doing today? I'm uh, quite well, thanks. <laughs> For anyone that doesn't know, uh, my name is Christina Carmody, and I have the lovely Michael Endler with us today. Lovely. lovely. Uh, you are in the great state of California, correct? Yeah, it's a big state. Not so great, but, uh, you know, we're being challenged everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, New York likes to think of themselves as quite high and mighty, but we're not that high or mighty these days either. Yeah. So, we're all trying. Um, but I'm really glad you're here with us, Michael. Um, we met, obviously, on the set of Ray Donovan, Showtime's show Ray Donovan. Um, but for people that don't know you, don't know Ray Donovan, uh, would you mind explaining a little bit about your career and specifically kind of how you got into cameras and the set in the first place? Um, sure. Um, my father was a mechanical effects, special effects, rain, smoke, fire, bullet hits. Uh, he had a, a, a card from the government that allowed him to ship arms and ammunitions across international borders when you could. This is, you know, back in the 60s. And uh, it seemed as if I was always around the film industry that way. Like, go visit dad, you know, where? Oh, we're in Colorado, we're in Mexico, we're in, you know, different parts. We went to China and lived for a year on a production there when I was like 10. So being exposed to the magic of filmmaking has always been a, ooh, a marvel, you know, of something to always just be, you know, curious about all the time, you know, and how's that gonna work? And having to like fabricate things, make things like, yes, we have this idea, we, we wanna make him fly. You know, like fly, well, have to job, uh, you know, so you have to rig something and wires and cables and stuff. So, our garage growing up was one of those special effects trucks that you look into that, like, it's very mysterious because it looks like anything could be produced in there and brought out at any given time. And then, uh, uh, working as a teenager and locations as a gopher, but not a PA, you know, more on set, go get the wrench, go dig a ditch, you know, manual labor and uh, to prepare for, for movies or TV shows and mostly movies. And um, once I got older into high school, there were some little projects you could do at school that involved, you know, making a movie, a Super 8 movie. Oh, I, I know how to do that. So that was always kind of fun. And then um, getting into college, it was uh, wanting to get out of that and actually try to maybe get into the medical field or something. But then when the... Uh, dead cat showed up in the biology class that we had to like start to analyze muscles it was like okay maybe this isn't what i was thinking and uh, cal state northridge at the time had a radio film tv course and so i i shifted over to that building and ended up uh during the summer working as a laborer at uh, 20th Century Fox. So at that time, the studio system was in effect. So the labor department on the lot, like the wardrobe or special effects or the mill or plumbing or carpet or drapery, they all had specific buildings that when a film or movie was uh, written and submitted to the studio, the studio in-house would take that script and shop it to their departments 
to put together a bid, so to speak, and how much it's going to cost. And then they'd report back, and then, then that would uh, let the studio know how much they're going to have to spend and how they're going to do it. And, and each department had their own interests about how they were going to do it. And they would pick a particular person within their department where they had a seniority uh, uh, situation where people with more seniority would be able to pick and choose projects that would come up. And if some people were more adept at, uh, you know, comedies or, you know, train movies or space movies or, you know, futuristic stuff, then that person who excelled in that would get jobbed out by the department head. So dad was always getting jobbed out to projects that involved uh, steam engines, locomotives, and large explosions, large pyrotechnic type work. So uh, that was always fun to kind of like be around, you know, and to play with his stuff in the garage when he wasn't around. And, uh, you know, and uh, as that labor world, it allowed me to work for different departments and get a feel for all the filmmaking needs, not just like the camera and or sound or, or somebody, you know. So that was, you know, educational to say the least, kind of like a college course in its own. And um, I think the turning point was uh, uh, being on a project and actually shooting something. And I had a, a mentor, uh, a friend of mine's mom was a photographer, Angie, Angela Butler. And she introduced me to the dark room and how to take pictures and what that was all about. And it just opened up a different window uh, of photography. And uh, I just ended up like saving money during my summer vacations, being a laborer on films, like, you know, Towering Inferno, the Planet of the Apes TV series, uh, TV shows like uh, Starsky and Hutch, James at 16, I remember those, and uh, saved my money and uh, went to film school up in Santa Barbara at a Brooks Institute of Photography and uh, started making, you know, getting involved seriously into the world of photography as a business. Mm. And filmmaking uh, was part of it, you know, making movies. And one thing led to another and ended up uh, having a partner whose wife worked for a hairdressing, uh, Nexus Hair Care Products. Oh, yeah, I remember you telling me about the hair care. And uh, we approached them with a, a treatment of, you know, what to do, what are their needs. And we met and we ended up doing this little product knowledge film. And I think that was like a, our first little do-all movie where you're all the departments, you know, you're making a student film. But it was for a business. So we had to come off a little bit more... Uh, professional and uh, things worked out and uh, worked for this company doing all their in-house photography up in Santa Barbara for a couple of years. They're a family run business and uh, not being family. Um, it reached a point where it was time to move on. And I did. And I came down to LA and the, uh, Worked at Hill Production Service. Uh, Bruce Hill gave me an opportunity to come in and uh, sweep the floor, clean filters, check batteries, make sure tripods worked, you know, the basic, because there were other rental uh, technicians there that would then show you what to do or tell you what to do, more than, more than that. And then there were some, some gentlemen in there uh, 
who uh, Paul Nielsen, who used to work for Todd AO, an older company, and they had these Photosonics cameras, high speed, that uh, I got involved with and uh, traveled a lot with that. And working in a rental house, you'd work with assistants to come in and prep. Well, you prep their prep. And uh, the more efficient you were at doing that, the more they then relied on you to do more to the point where they then invited you, well, hey, once I have a job next week, why don't you come out and load for us? Sure, you come out and load, but you not only do you drive the van with the camera truck, you load, you second AC, and you break out the extra camera, and you're pulling focus as well. So uh, uh, I just had a knack for it and an understanding of work ethic and preparing, getting ahead, finding out what was going on. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, you're doing a movie and that movie gets you to another movie and work begets work. And I ended up being this, this technician of sorts that uh, traveled around and, uh, Got hooked up with a company, MovieCam. A friend of mine, Max Penner, was uh, the lead on that, working for Cinema Products, MovieCam from Austria, set up a base in uh, uh, Cinema Products to sell their cameras. And Hill Production Service, where I was working, bought two of them. Denny Claremont at the time, uh, they bought two of them. And so we had to keep these cameras working. And being a not a prototype, but a first run camera from Europe here in the United States, it was difficult. It had problems that had to get worked out. Yeah. And uh, my background kind of helped me with that and met meeting Max. And he also had that wizardry and became a, a big mentor for me. And uh, that whole mentor thing is, is something that's very strong and I feel it needs to get passed on as no matter what we're doing, uh, mm -hmm. as you remember, I'm Ray Donovan, you know, and uh, just to pass on responsibility to everybody else. And it's all became part of this filmmaking process and uh, the team effort and magic of movies is uh, something that uh, cannot be rivaled. I mean, you know, filmmaking is the ultimate uh, message. Media is the message kind of thing. Well, I know you have this marvelous career that's still <clears throat> going on. Still going. <laughs> still going. In, in, in spite of the pandemic, yeah. But I feel like that's something that I need to always mention is that, you know, I'm, I'm honored that you're here with us today, but it's partly due to the pandemic, right? Like unless I was working with you on set, I wouldn't be able to have this time to talk with you. You know, we'd be on set having these stories. It wouldn't be like we have free time. So part of my series is, is also asking people how they stay inspired and stay sane when they're working versus how they're staying inspired and staying sane now. You know, like when you're working for, you know, and you're in that like hustling mode, almost like survival mode and, you're going like, okay, next job, this job, next job, this, you know? And then I'm just curious if you uh, could explain a bit about how you stay grounded and um, stay yourself in between or during all of it. Yeah, well, that, that's a tough one. That was probably the toughest, that's a tough question because when I mean, one, uh, work begets work. And when you're in a, uh, an assistant category, people recognize you for what you do and then that career kind of just takes off and uh if you find yourself surrounded with the right group of people through whatever your dedication is hopefully that that trail the forks in the road that are going to be in front of you you're able to make the right decisions um you know, raising a family at the same time. You know, I have two children and I've been married for uh, 30, 36 years. So um, it's, it, it's, it's not easy, you know. Uh, been very fortunate 
I'm very grateful for the people that I've come in contact with that one that uh, we were able to do something collaborative together and to have that collaborative frame of mind versus like, you know, there's all those funny little sayings, my way or the highway, you know, we won't say what department says that the most, but you know, uh, it, it goes, you know, with that where, you know, it's, I've always considered it pay it forward, you know, every, film I've worked on it seems like you're surrounded by the right people you know whether it be a, a Roger Deakins or a Dean Cundy or you know Alexander Brzezinski or Yasek Laskus or Jamie Anderson or Paul Cameron or Don Burgess you know we all have our little intricacies that we have to like figure out and and uh it's just a, a, a conscious effort where you just kind of almost give it to the universe to help yourself. Mm. And uh, if you do good, good things will come back, you know? Have you, you know? have you found that there are certain cinematographers that you've worked with on set that because of your experience working with them and because of the type of person that you are, that you've then been inspired to watch all of their other projects they've done um well sure because you know if you get a call from someone like rob mclaughlin who we just did you know i just did seven seasons of ray donovan with the guy yeah. you know we go back to that that first phone call where you know hello yeah hi and it was for a a, a film called the one jet lee long time ago and i got referred you know by someone else to him because they weren't available and lo and behold you know you just you are who you are and uh you know if the if it melds it melds you know and uh research wise sure you know guy calls up says oh what what he's done you know usually it's more directorial you know, okay. to find out who the director is, because then you get a style for what is going to happen on the set, you know, and find out who they've worked with before, and you you contact them, say, hey, you know, da, 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 oh, by the way, how come you're not working with them again? You know, oh, I have another job, or, yeah, the guy was, like, difficult to be kind. That's difficult. Uh, difficult. And, uh, you know, you can choose whether you want to get uh, beat up all the time, you know, or into something that's a little more adaptable, you know. Yeah. I think the family aspect of it had something to do with it as well, you know. But, uh, Would you say is uh your experience with ray donovan starting in la and then coming to new york is that the longest job you've been on or the longest collaboration sure. with other crew yeah you know because up until then you know movie to movie to movie you do two or three movies a year and uh depending on the director of photography they aren't necessarily doing every one of those movies yeah. so uh there are people who like to attach themselves to one person yeah and that you know oh my cameraman you know like nobody owns a cameraman i mean for god's sake you know yeah and uh uh you end up just doing the work that you do and people will respect that and uh and pull you out i mean granted this last run with rob uh was yes the longest i've ever you know and uh, it was great, you know, it was awesome, you know, in that respect. But uh, you always keep touch with everybody you've worked with in the past, never burn bridges. Yeah. You know, you climb up the ladder, you're going to have to come back down the ladder and pass those same people again, you know. So uh, you can pick and choose where you need to be, and hopefully, uh, the universe sees it that way as well, you know.
Well, as I've been talking to other people in our industry through this series, uh, it's been more and more curious to me about people's paths within our department. I mean, it's the same with any department, really. But some people go in, you know, it's like they start film school or they start their kind of career in film. It's like, I want to be a director. Like, I want to be the cinematographer. And then they actually are in it. You know, like they're in the sausage factory and they like see how it's made and maybe yeah. it changes. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit about your experience working with so many cinematographers and, and like. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, in the very beginning, you know, film school, director of photography, you know. At, at age 30, I'll be 65 this year. So like, you know, age 30, you're, 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 you set out some goals and you, you know, love to be, you know, work hard, be a director of photography within 20 years, because at that time, the studio system, again, you have to, you know, get your chops in. How can you expect somebody to do something if you haven't done it yourself? So coming up through the ranks of the camera department from loader to second to first to operate to second unit director of photography to director of photography. Uh, films and movies, because of their short intensity and how much money is usually involved in them, usually camera crews in particular are chosen and for a position and that's what you're gonna do and you, you know you're not in it to look to move up where i found in the tv world if you get on a show that goes a length of time that people will move on due to life situations and they need to be replaced and or move on or if uh, 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 an operator or a first or anybody has a, an opportunity to do another job elsewhere. You know, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. And, uh, especially if you get to do something at a, at a higher level of responsibility, you, you do that. That way you're able to, you know, move up, move up, move up. And hopefully someone that you work with above you recognizes that and, says you know give you an opportunity to do the same thing but you again have to wait for that opportunity to show up so uh yeah there's been directors of photography that have given me opportunities to shoot and or operate and uh um, it's been great you know but again it, it falls into that place of what you do so well, you know, pigeonholed sometimes. And uh, within the assistance world, there's a, a monetary thing that you get involved in with the equipment and uh, you could be making money, thereby taking care of your family, knowing that if you, you know, change positions or do something else, it's a leap of faith, and you uh, may not have the economic uh, uh, reward initially, but you can work into it depending on who it is that you're able to be given an opportunity by, you know. Yeah. Are there certain, um, well, it's, it's funny because I, I know that some people think of employment and their job as there's the employer and the employees and it's like very strict hierarchy of who's the boss and who's taking the orders or who's receiving the orders but i feel like on set it's we're very fortunate when it seems so collaborative you know and it's not just you're my boss but how are we working together and i'm just wondering if there are certain bosses or certain department heads you've had or even people below you too that you've been really inspired by and then I've like always kind of stuck out to you of like, oh, when I was on that job, um, I was just really inspired by how that person worked or. Yeah, it, it seems like every director of photography that I've worked with <clears throat> has something individually about them as a personality, as a person, as a, as a cameraman 
uh, uh, that you will learn from, you know, whether it's what not to do, let alone, oh, that's a great idea. What a, a, a great idea, one, and or what a great person they are. You know, uh, I find myself gravitating towards the people part as well, you know, as the photographic part. And uh, um, if you acknowledge that person that way and give them the respect that comes with that, you know, in an acknowledgement that it'll come back to you as well, you know. Um, there was a time when, you know, I was working with a lot of cameramen from, from Europe in the very beginning, you know. Um, that whole movie cam aspect kind of opened up a door yeah. uh, to productions that I probably would not have been involved in if I wasn't a, a technician of sorts to keep the camera working, you know. And um, always interesting to see different points of view, you know. Mm. And um, as work progressed, you come in contact with different directors of photography that also would be experiencing new experiences and then they would re either rely on you to help them or I, an idea that needs to just be modified a little bit and it's always nice to be you know respected that way and uh, you give what you get you know well, I'm curious, Michael, since the COVID, since uh, the quarantine, yeah. have you spent any time re-watching any of the movies that you used to work on? Well, yeah, it's, you know, yeah, you know, that's, that's even funnier to look back because you're always so caught up in what you're doing every day because it's going to be, well, what's next? What's next? Yeah. It's always about what's next because if you don't have what's next, uh, you know, there's going to be a struggle. So, uh, yeah, actually, uh, we pulled out some old movies and actually, uh, some of the, the, the streaming also, and there were some movies, you know, that they're not like, Oh, Hey, Oh, that I, I worked on that, you know, that type of thing. So yeah, I got, I got caught up watching some of the old films and, you know, as you look at the scenes and as the, the film goes by, you more or less start looking at it like, oh yeah, I remember that. I was all covered up with uh, goggles, ear protection, eye protection, nose breathing a suit, and the rain started from the rain towers and the explosions were going off and mud yeah. was flying and, and you see it on film or, you know, and it's like, wow, there was a lot of work involved for that five second shot. <laughs> but it, it, just, it just made you feel proud that you were able to contribute to something. Because when you see a film like that put together, it's like, wow, that, was, you know, that really meant a lot. You know? are, there, are there certain movies that you are specifically proud of? Like, I was a part of that. Like, how cool. Like, it's like a part of our cinematic history, you know, like this is a big deal kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah, there are a couple, you know, and, uh, you know, most recent, this whole Ray Donovan world, TV world, uh, with Rob enabled us to uh, be very creative with a style and a look that uh, uh, Rob brought along and enhanced through all of his experience. I mean, endless hours of episodic that you know just to live through it is awesome you know so uh when you find yourself thrown in a, a booyah base of sort of uh mix of people like that there isn't anything that comes down the road that you can't really tackle to uh sell the producer on you know well, I feel like from what I've known of you working with you and also hearing today, um, if you'll bear with me with this analogy here or metaphor, I feel like 
you and your experience have been like, what's that phrase about the post office? Like come rain, come sleet, come snow, like we'll still <laughs> deliver the mail. Like I feel yeah. like you've literally done, all, you've done sand. Have you done snow? Have you done a movie in the snow? Yeah, I did a film called uh, Promised Land. Okay. Way back with uh, Kiefer Sutherland, Meg Ryan, Jason Gretarick, and we were in Utah. Yeah. And uh, production started January 3rd. <laughs> and we were there for, you know, three months through the whole winter season. And, and uh, yeah, having to deal with snow, you know, cold, I mean, really cold. And then uh, uh, commercials is always a string of car commercials that you find yourself up in Wyoming and Montana. Yeah. Snowmobile, a snowmobile, Yamaha snowmobile commercial with a, a fellow, uh, Doug Davis, good guy, commercial uh, cameraman, director, and uh, got involved in that kind of world, the snow world, yeah. Underwater as well, you know, different projects. Jungles, you've done jungles? Jungle. jungle. Went to Africa and lived with pygmies for three months uh, with Conrad win, Hall. You'd win like the um, like film bingo or something of like, okay, done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no check. Jungle right. check. Desert yeah. check, right? Middle East? Uh, the Middle East no. or where, no. where did you film Jarhead? Oh, Jarhead was done um, east of San Diego. Oh. <laughs> out in the desert there. Also the Middle Mexico East. Cali. Just Mexicali, as well as we, you know, hopped into Mexico to do certain scenes that involved uh, uh, situations we needed to be uh, across the border on versus here in the United States. Oh. <laughs> what else would be on that bingo, do you think, besides sand, snow, jungle, jungle. underwater? Tornadoes. We started off with Twister, started Twister, did you know prep for everything is is where we yeah. live and die so prepping for twister was a, a a major project major undertaking panavision anamorphic uh at the time it was with don burgess and uh i think we made it through uh, probably four or five weeks of it and then uh as best as can be described, uh, creative differences between oh. the cameraman and the uh, director, uh, Jan de Bont, uh, arose and um, allegiance to who hired you was uh, recommended. Oh. So uh, Jack Green came in and finished the show as well as uh, a bunch of other camera guys. Yeah. And what else would be on the list? Aerial work? You've done it. I feel like you've told me a bit about strapping cameras to planes. And uh, yeah, there's some helicopter, airplane stuff, but not, uh, uh, not really gyro sphere work. There was a, a, a sequence uh, on Pelican Brief down in uh, New Orleans where they had a gyro sphere uh, provided and um, there's a, a shot where they pulled up out of the courtyard after Julia Roberts was getting ready to get on a boat and some guy comes up and shoots another guy in the back of the head and he falls down and the helicopter pulls up and away revealing thousands of people running for their lives and this guy bleeding out. And uh, when the dailies came back, uh, one side of the frame was out of focus. and. Uh, uh, the director of photography uh, came to me on the truck, or came to the camera truck and said, hey, anybody have a collimator? And I go, yeah, you know, I got a, something in my box here. He goes, well, get out to the airport, take a look at this camera and lens. I think we have a problem. And uh, it was like the next day. And uh, um, okay, so I remember going out there and 
putting the collimator up to the lens and the, the housing and things just didn't, it, something was off, couldn't figure out optics. Something had shifted in the lens, I guess, I don't know. Uh, and uh, on further inspection, it had an older revitalized Mitchell camera that had an anamorphic, you know, 10 to one on it, huge Tadeo lens, one or two in the world, that kind of thing. Yeah, and uh, I needed to pull it out of the the housing to get a better look. And when I did, I uh, pulled the lens off to take a look at the mount to see if something was wrong. And I noticed that the lens mount on the back of the lens was a little cocked, a little it wasn't perpendicular. It was a little yeah. So I remember looking at the back of the mount. And there are screws that hold it in, and uh, three of them were appeared to be missing. And uh, I'm like, oh, well, that's weird because there are these little hex head, little Allen head, and the heads were missing. And I looked like, well, where are they? You know, and I looked inside the camera and down in the bottom, just inside the lens, I could see them nestled, took a piece of tape on the end of a pencil and stuck them and brought them out. And, oh, how did these come off? They look broken. So when I looked at the mount again, I could see that the rest of the screw was still in there. And I had a little leather mallet and gave it a little smack and it squared out the mount. I took the screws off, took the mount off, took the broken screws out took the three screws that were left, <coughs> triangulated them, put them back in the mount, stuck it back in the camera, blah, 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 put the color, and everything was sharp as, okay, that must have been it. How, how did that happen, you know? And I guess they, what I was told was that the, the system, camera, lens, motors, was shipped as one piece. So when it was in the case, it must have taken a hit and tweaked the lens because it didn't have a tie down screw for the lens support. And it just wasn't noticed by, uh, unfortunately, the technician that was assigned to work with this yeah. device. And uh, I remember going back to the camera truck and the director of photography, uh, um, well, what did you find out? Well, <clears throat> I got these three little screws that I, that, uh, you know, told him the story. And the producer was there, too, because this involved money, because they had to redo the shot, the big shot. And he was going to do it. They were going to schedule it for the next day. So here they are, you know, scheduling, bringing back another thousand people to redo this one shot. shot. And... Uh, I remember the director of photography was going, are you sure this is going to work? I go, yeah, yeah. He goes, well, you know, I have a, a big career, and if this doesn't work, it's my ass. I go, okay. He goes, and he just we just looked at each other, <laughs> and there was this moment of, of passage of trust. And he goes, okay, let's do it. And because uh, they – we're looking for another lens, you know, okay. to bring in, but there weren't any in the availability to fly it in and to shoot the next day. And, up yeah. and, up. and I said, no, it's, it's fine. So we, they, they did the shot again and it's, it's in the movie and Pelican brief, you know, the helicopter shot down on the boardwalk. And so when you see things like that, it, uh, it's nice. I had such an image in my head, a very like Sergio Leone shot of like <laughs> close ups of your eyes. And it's like his eyes, your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's like, I got this. <laughs> yeah. But there was that. So when you, you reach into those moments with, you know, coworkers, it's like, you know, between the two of us. And there's like hundreds of thousands of dollars a day being spent. And you're like, yeah. Okay, let's do it. Roll the dice. Well, that actually leads me to a little segue here. 
Uh, in your experience working with producers and people above and below the line in regards to the almost technical and tactical aspects of your job, um, how do you feel like all that experience is shifting and now playing out with COVID, like in the idea of, it's almost weird to say post COVID because I don't think it's just gonna go away. Like I know people early on were talking about this almost miraculous idea that one day it could just be done. Yeah. But in this world where we're still dealing with pandemics and we're also trying to find work again, um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you negotiate, I don't know, like the old logistics of trust as well as gear maintenance and human maintenance, all that. Well, it, it's a juggling act, you know. I'll just say I'm, I'm just fortunate to have been surrounded by good people. And with that, good things will come about it. You know, I, I mentioned earlier about giving to the universe and it gets back to you. And uh, it's a place where some people go, ah, that's a bunch of hooey. But, you know, I really believe that as this pandemic shows us, uh, you have to be with good people, you know. Uh, today's political climate, there are good people and there are bad people, you know, and uh, you surround yourself with good people because you're a good person, like yourself, you know. Uh, things will uh, come to them. They can't not. They may not be what you envisioned, but they are good things, you know. Well, Michael, I could talk to you forever. And forever. Ever and ever. <laughs> but I'm not sure if anyone is still listening. Maybe people are. That'd be awesome. But yeah, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe you've all have tuned out by this point. I think, uh, yeah, everybody's already turned this off and said, <laughs> what a bunch of hooey that is, right? Well, I just, I just really appreciate your time. And I obviously would rather be having this conversation in between setups or over a beer or yeah. over coffee in yeah. real life. But yeah. yeah, but I'm really glad to have your time today. And um, I hope we get back to all the things soon. Yes. And as an NAB member of Local 600, uh, I want to be able to, to reach out to anybody uh, who may be having a difficult time right now, that to be able to put it into words and to verbalize it, to share it, uh, uh, is a big part of your inner wealth, as they say, you know, your spirit, who you really are. and. Uh, um, Get out and vote. Yeah. Vote. <laughs> That's a great ending. Get out and vote, everyone. <laughs> Get out Hopefully, and vote. I know? post this before November. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Michael. I'm going to stop recording now, but I really appreciate oh, it. Okay. Very good. It was a pleasure, Christina. Can't wait till uh, we push a cart up a hill together one more time. <laughs> Till then. <laughs> okay.